We live in what appears to be a world of ever-increasing dangers. We want, we need, to find a way of reducing those dangers. One of the keys to doing it might be the use of statecraft and leadership. I'm going to be talking to a range of experts about the past and the future of statecraft and leadership. Can we use those skills now to rescue ourselves? Rory Metcalf is head of the National Security College at the Australian National University. The Australian experience of weathering Chinese coercion and preparing for future tension provides distinct lessons for democracies and for middle powers in a dangerous world. Let's start with AUKUS, with the pact. What is it? What's it setting out to achieve? So it's essentially a technology sharing arrangement. Uh, of course, it's a little bit deeper than that because it's uh, an arrangement to share the most sensitive uh, strategic technologies, really the crown jewels of American and indeed of, um, of British military capability. It's about sharing uh, nuclear powered submarine technology with Australia. And really it's about making Australia a stronger strategic actor, an actor capable of uh, serious deterrence in its region, in our region, the, the Indo-Pacific. But as well as the submarine technology sharing arrangement, in other words, ensuring that the Australian Navy in the future has a uh, nuclear powered submarine fleet, it's about uh, really pooling the uh, industrial technology scientific bases of the three countries, the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, in other technologies, in critical technologies for security. So cyber, uh, quantum, uh, unmanned, uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, particularly underwater, hypersonics uh, and so forth, quite a long list. And that in turn has the potential to bring more partners into the arrangement in the future, but it's important just to emphasise that what it's not is a new security treaty. It's not mm. uh, you know, a replacement for the bilateral treaty with the United States or for other treaty arrangements. It's not an alliance. It's really using existing relationships of trust to share technology. And if it's successful, what does it achieve? I guess the ultimate objective for Australia uh, is deterrent power, is, is having uh, uh, leading edge nuclear powered submarine fleet, but also ensuring that Australia remains with its partners and with its uh, US ally at the leading edge of defence technologies in the Indo-Pacific. There's more than that, of course, because this is also about reinforcing the US-led alliance system in the Indo-Pacific. So it's a piece of the architecture to prevent destabilising action to prevent aggressive action uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. In other words, it is part of regional deterrence uh, against China. The Chinese said that it was an escalation. I mean, could it be seen in those terms? Is there any realistic way in which it could be? There is a very active Chinese-led campaign of uh, disinformation about AUKUS in the Indo-Pacific. and. It's quite easy for uninformed observers to look at this on the surface and say, well, it's about defence technology, therefore it's about arms racing, therefore it's about escalation, it's about powerful, uh, powerful capabilities, nuclear-powered submarines, therefore it's escalation, therefore it's an arms race. The reality, however, is that uh, Australia is really stepping up to protect its interests and the interests of partners and allies. Uh, in competition with capabilities that others are introducing to the region. So uh, when our friends in Southeast Asia uh, ask questions about AUKUS and ask questions about whether this means uh, an Australian uh, submarine fleet, an Australian nuclear powered submarine fleet will be operating uh, in future in their waters, in their region, there's already a fast growing nuclear powered submarine fleet operating in those waters and it's China's. So in that sense, uh, AUKUS is really about Australia trying to reintroduce uh, its own sense of balance to the strategic environment and the important diplomatic message that I think our government is getting better at, um, at prosecuting 
is a message to say that this is really about providing stability uh, to help our partners and allies as, as well, including in Southeast Asia. A couple of other, uh, um, um, not exactly criticisms of it, but concerns about it from the European perspective. Number one, what does it do to the relationship with France? NATO member yeah. um, um, snubbed by the purchase of these nuclear-powered submarines uh, potentially not from France, well, certainly not yeah. from France now. And how, is, how is that being sorted out? Look, that's a completely fair question. And as someone who uh, has invested quite a lot of uh, really uh, energy and commitment and thought into the relationship with France over the years and into relations between Australia and Europe, uh, I can understand where that's coming from. The diplomacy uh, around the introduction of AUKUS or the announcement of the AUKUS arrangement uh, in September 2021 uh, had some clumsiness to it. Uh, the French understandably, and I think Macron personally, uh, did feel snubbed. There wasn't strictly the breaking of a contract. There was the exit of a contract at a, if you like, a, a gateway or a milestone. You know, it, it was it was legal or legitimate within the terms of the contract. But there was obviously a sense of uh, betrayal and a sense of mistrust on the part of the French. Um, that puts aside the question that, in fact, some years earlier, uh, the French had basically outflanked uh, a Japanese uh, understanding with Australia to provide a conventional submarine fleet for Australia. So there's, there's a longer history there. But coming back to the core issue, of course, there was damage to the Australia-France bilateral relationship. I don't think that is lasting damage to Australia's relations with Europe more generally. And I think that over time, there's been some quite effective um, repair work in the Australia-France relationship because, of course, Australia and France need one another in the Indo-Pacific. France is an Indo-Pacific power. It has territories in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Uh, it's, in, in a sense, if, if, if you if you look at uh, New Caledonia, you could actually say that France is Australia's closest developed country neighbour. So, uh, in that regard, we need to continue the repair work, but I think the understanding as I see it in France and in Europe more generally now is that Australia is looking at its submarine fleet at the AUKUS submarine capabilities with a very cold strategic eye, uh, looking for the best capability we can have to suit our strategic circumstances. And that is the hard choice that our government has taken. Uh, and that, I think, is a choice that uh, friends in Europe are beginning to respect. I suppose the wider strategic fear would be that France begins to go it alone with China more than it already has done, that President Macron develops a relationship and is sort of peeled off by the Chinese. Is, is, is that at all realistic? Look, I, I'm not someone who shares that concern deeply, I, and I don't think that AUKUS has an effect on that one way or another. Uh, when I speak privately with French strategists, and I won't name names on that, but when I, when, when I speak with, I think, the best strategic uh, thinkers in Paris, uh, they themselves have a very unsentimental view of China. They themselves uh, know what a strategic risk China is in the international system. And in fact, if you look at the history of France's own strategic capability, including its own nuclear deterrent, I think there's always been an eye on the global picture as well as on uh, the European theatre. So I think Ultimately, uh, the French recognise that they have an interest in solidarity with democratic partners globally. Uh, but as for Macron's diplomacy, uh, week by week, day by day, uh, it's probably not, not, not something for me to comment on more generally. And I, th I think that that's, um, uh, if you read the French strategic documents, if you read their Indo-Pacific strategy and their defence strategy, uh, in fact, they're, they're still broadly like-minded uh, with Australia, and that's good news. Another concern uh, that there is with AUKUS, uh, and it's a, a slightly incoherent one, I suppose, in a sense, but I mean, it obviously benefits Britain in many respects, but there is also this fear, hang on a second, the waters around Australia, indeed around China, are an awful long way away, but mm. it's pretty stretched defence-wise mm. anyway, very stretched, yeah. particularly after what's happened in Ukraine. We're stretching ourselves too much. Mm strategically as, as well as sort of physically and practically? Look, uh, 
I've heard that point and I can understand, absolutely understand concerns that the United Kingdom or really any other partner uh, shouldn't be overstretching its resources. I think this goes back to the question that uh, like-minded countries and democracies, we all have finite capabilities. It is a, uh, a challenging strategic environment out there, a sort of a growing horizon of risk, and none of us can do it alone. Uh, we also each need to prioritise our own geographic uh, theatre. So I don't think anyone in Australia is expecting that Britain's going to be you know, a principal frontline uh, military partner in the Indo-Pacific, but that's not what AUKUS is about. So I think in many ways that, to my mind, that concern or criticism misreads AUKUS. You know, AUKUS is principally a strategic technology sharing arrangement. Yes, it will involve and should involve uh, increased presence by the Royal Navy, particularly in the Indian Ocean. So regular visits, rotations, uh, you know, effectively uh, an informal basing arrangement uh, in Western Australia for the Royal Navy, but particularly for uh, the US Navy. But ultimately, that's a um, relatively small part of the AUKUS picture, which is really about providing the technology to Australia. The fact is that uh, the Royal Navy already operates in the Indo-Pacific and has for many years. Uh, for example, uh, an interesting um, little um, data point is when the, um, uh, there was the search for the, um, the tragically missing Malaysian airliner in the Indian Ocean uh, some years ago now, about, about a decade ago, uh, there was a, a, a British uh, nuclear-powered submarine as part of that search in the Indian Ocean because Britain is a country with global reach. And so I think really what we would be seeing under AUKUS is uh, a difference in degree um, and regularity of British presence, but not uh, an expectation that Britain would suddenly become the decisive strategic player in the Indo-Pacific. And I think if you look globally at the need to deter aggression by authoritarian countries, if you look globally at the need to maintain stability, uh, in many ways, uh, the best thing that Britain and European partners can be doing for countries like Australia or Japan or other Indo-Pacific partners is first and foremost securing their own region. Um, and that in, itse in itself will help ensure that the United States has more capability to bring to bear uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So I think it's that point is, 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 is taken on board. It's a really interesting point, that, isn't it, that all of these conflicts are joined, all these potential conflicts, as some of them are, 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 are in a sense very closely joined. Well, there's a strong argument, um, not um, an argument that, um, that can't be challenged, but there is a strong argument that there's a global theatre of competition effectively uh, between the authoritarian partnership of, um, of China and Russia in particular and a broad coalition, largely of democracies of, of, of varying, um, you know, varying uh, shapes and qualities, but also other smaller countries that simply want uh, sovereignty to be preserved and that want to uphold a rules-based order uh, and an order that reflects the UN Charter. And I think although there are valid questions to be asked about whether China's objectives and Russia's objectives are, are different, and certainly, thankfully, we haven't seen um, at this point from China the kind of aggression uh, that we've seen from Russia, nonetheless, the, um, the partnership the extraordinary partnership that uh, Putin and Xi effectively agreed on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine and the fact that China has been so reluctant to, uh, to criticise or really uh, terminate uh, Russia's um, aggression uh, is a signal that there really is one strategic theatre and therefore it makes sense for like-minded countries to be reaching out across the globe and not being bound by old, um, if you like, geographic mm. zones of interest. Henry Kissinger was saying recently that he thought at the moment the United States and China were on a trajectory towards conflict, but he said that can be altered. Yeah. Is this part of the altering, do you think? So uh, the, the US-China relationship is obviously central to the global strategic balance and the, uh, the risks or the opportunities globally. I would note just as a, well, a really important side point that uh, a lot of the tension in the Indo-Pacific region and the risks of crisis and conflict are not only about the US-China relationship right. in many ways. So, uh, you know, the, the power and interests and agency of other actors such as Japan and India, I think, needs to be 
brought into that conversation, and, and indeed um, Australia itself. But of course the US-China relationship is the big one. Uh, there's intense strategic competition. I think the choice in many ways, in fact the choice absolutely is China's as to where it wants to take that strategic competition because uh, there can be a tolerable or even healthy level of competitive coexistence between great powers uh, and great powers with very different political systems. Uh, but I think the choice ultimately is China's. Uh, if it's serious about the idea of rising peacefully, if the material needs and indeed the need for respect in the international system of the Chinese people can be met uh, without, if you like, um, risk of military confrontation. And I believe it, it can be met without that risk. Um, it does involve a, uh, a change of tone in the way China looks at Taiwan, but we can, we can come to that. Mm. Then, of course, US-China conflict can be averted. Uh, clearly, the United States, in the past five years or so, has um, accepted, I wouldn't say embraced, but accepted the reality of strategic competition with China. Uh, and there are obviously different grades and shades of opinion in the US strategic community on that. But I think on balance where the Biden administration has been taking things towards competitive coexistence, towards trying to set limits and boundaries to China's behaviour without escalation uh, is the right one. And I think in many ways, if you're looking at this from Europe, uh, then the, uh, the best support that partners around the globe can be lending to that is ensuring that we don't fall into a kind of a narrative trap that this is all about um, American primacy trying to constrain China's natural rise. In fact, I think it's a, it's a much more sophisticated story than that. And we don't, in my view, want to play into a, a Chinese narrative uh, that this is simply an old great power trying to squash a new rising power, when the reality is that most of China's neighbours and most of China's own region want to see some kind of limits set so that China respects their own sovereignty, their own interests and their own values. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because you do actually see it portrayed in those terms increasingly in, in the Western media, almost unthinkingly actually, that well this is, this is what's happening, China's on the rise, America's trying to defend its interests and it, it's interesting that you point out to us all that the true picture may well be, well as you say, much more complicated. Than well that. Asia is much bigger than China and so if you look at Japan, South Korea, India, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, the list goes on. And most of those countries, most of the time, would like to see a substantial US presence in the region, not necessarily American primacy, but America supporting partners and allies in the region to ensure that the peaceful rules-based order that frankly has brought prosperity to Asia, to the Indo-Pacific and to the world for decades, um, endures and that if change comes, as change comes, that it occurs peacefully and with respect for the rights of others. And that brings us to Taiwan. Yes. Uh, your thoughts? So where to begin? I think uh, Taiwan is clearly identified as the, the number one flashpoint, the number one place of risk in the US-China relationship um, and in the Indo-Pacific region as well. So as we watch the, uh, the horror of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as we watch the consequences of that aggression, uh, it's being studied intensely in the Indo-Pacific. It's been studied very closely by China, but also by uh, the people and the security establishment of Taiwan uh, and by the United States and others with uh, a core question in mind, that is, can uh, aggression be deterred in the Indo-Pacific? Um, what's the net effect of the invasion of Ukraine for the other side of the world? I think the, uh, the tragedy in many ways of the China-Taiwan relationship or the cross-straits relationship is that, uh, in fact, uh, in the, uh, the basic interests of the people of China. If you look at the, you know, the extraordinary achievement of economic growth in that country over, over many years, if you look at the way in which for much of the past few decades there has been a certain stability and reassurance uh, that, the, that we've actually had from China as it's risen, that's all over. And it's over partly because in many ways as the Communist Party and the uh, leadership, the authoritarian, indeed 
in some ways totalitarian leadership uh, of, of Xi Jinping and his circle as they look to the um, survival of their system and the uh, retention of their power. The Chinese claimed Taiwan on the argument that um, there's an unfinished civil war, effectively, and that, that in a sense China cannot be China until uh, the uh, 23 million people of Taiwan have been, if you like, um, robbed of their democratic system. That's, to my mind, at the core, at the core of the problem, at the core of the challenge. Uh, I think China and Taiwan have coexisted as uh, two very different systems um, across the Taiwan Strait for decades, and it's been mutually beneficial to them. It's helped uh, Taiwan evolve as a critical part of the regional and global economy, and as, frankly, uh, one of the most sophisticated um, democratic societies in the world. Uh, why should that end now? And so I think the, um, the narrative that China and those who would privilege a Chinese worldview uh, is being prosecuted. It's a narrative that um, somehow this cannot last, that it's inevitable that Taiwan will be absorbed into uh, the PRC, uh, that China's view of history or the PRC's official view of history, which uh, is, is, is pretty questionable when it comes to the, the, the history and status of Taiwan, uh, is such that it's only a matter of time before this happens and therefore shouldn't it happen peacefully, shouldn't the United States or Japan or Australia or, or European partners or others who would support actually a stable status quo in the Indo-Pacific, if only they would get out of the way then everything would be fine. And so I think it's really important to look at achieving deter deterrence with stability in the Indo-Pacific, achieving deterrence in a way that remains stabilising and that isn't in itself destabilising. And that's where the um, argument for, as the US administration calls them, guardrails or confidence building measures, or risk reduction measures, dialogue uh, with China becomes really important. It's about ensuring that uh, not only is there deterrence, but it's clearly signalled so that each morning, effectively, the leadership of the PLA wakes up, takes a look across the strait and says, not, not today. Mm. If we can have that future for years, it could be a decade, it could be longer, I think there are structural forces at work that will lead to a more stable Indo-Pacific region, a more balanced region. China has its own problems internally that will continue to evolve over time, apart from anything else, the, the rapid ageing of the population. Other players in the region are becoming more effective, even though Japan's had its own decline in terms of population. Uh, Japan's defence modernisation is really quite an extraordinary story um, in recent years and in the years ahead. Um, Indonesia is becoming a more substantial power in the region. Uh, South Korea is beginning to show, uh, I think, a more robust set of policy settings. Uh, and of course, itself is quite a powerful security actor. Uh, India, Australia, there's a whole range of partners. And of course, Europe re-engaging in the Indo-Pacific. So I guess a more confident vision for that region is one where we can maintain stability for long enough that a benign form of multipolarity begins to take hold in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, multipolarity is no longer a code for the world that China or Russia claim they want to see, but it's actually a code for coexistence in the region. But it's about buying time. Does, does Ukraine buy time? Yeah. That's, that's, that's the question. Mm. And I, when I say yes, um, that's a very provisional uh, yes. I mean, I think my initial judgment after the invasion last year uh, and watching the, um, the, the catastrophe, but also watching the utter failure of Putin's um, military uh, strategy, uh, if you could call it that to begin with, all of that would have been studied very closely in China. And I have read, for example, um, assessments by Chinese strategists that even within the censorship regime in China acknowledge what a disappointment Russia has been, what a military disappointment this has been, and that acknowledge how hard war actually is, even if you think you're the powerful actor. So 
you know, on a good day, you would say that those messages are beginning to filter through the Chinese system. But there are a few question marks there. One is, what is the quality of advice that actually reaches the leadership? Secondly, what is the calculus within China as, uh, as to whether time is on China's side or time is on America's side or um, time is on nobody's side? And I think, sadly, there is a view that there's a window of risk. The window of risk is really the next five to seven years, uh, probably towards the end of this decade in particular. That's a moment where, for several years, China's military modernisation and the acceleration of that will have provided enough of a capability edge and enough um, confidence, perhaps overconfidence in the Chinese system that they really could take Taiwan by force before a lot of the, um, the responses that the United States and its allies have been pursuing, including AUKUS, begin to take effect. Because I think if you look to the 2030s, in fact, um, a lot of what the United States has been doing to reinforce the alliance system in the Indo-Pacific, to reinforce its own capabilities, to disperse forces, to get better at fighting with lots of small platforms rather than the small number of exquisite platforms, you know, aircraft carriers, for example, that it's traditionally relied on. You can see that um, integrated deterrence from the United States begin to really take effect some years from now. So the fear is that China sees a capability window of opportunity, that Xi Jinping sees a political window of not only opportunity but almost desperation, wanting to cement that legacy as uh, the great leader who has reunited uh, the motherland. And so I think the focus on deterrence has to be uh, really concentrated over the next five to ten years. And I want to introduce a question about economic deterrence there because in many ways uh, the, one of the messages of the uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, has been the unforeseen uh, economic consequences globally. Uh, of course, that would be um, really put in the shade by the economic consequences of an invasion of Taiwan because it would be catastrophic for uh, the Indo-Pacific region, which really is now the centre of global growth. Um, supply chains would shut down, shipping would shut down. Uh, players in Europe, including uh, in the private sector, uh, who look at China as a continued source of um, growth and prosperity, would have to think radically again. If those aggregate uh, commercial realisations that it's not going to be business as usual once a Taiwan conflict starts, if those realisations could somehow be um, aggregated into a, uh, a policy of economic signalling and effectively economic deterrence to China, it might just be one additional factor along with the military deterrence that would um, delay that moment uh, perhaps uh, forever. With that fascinating thought, we must leave it. Rory Mackar, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.